Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started singing here. If everyone could come on in and grab a seat, and I need my guitar on in the sound, please. mountains and the sea, your river runs with love for me, and I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth, and I will daily lift my hands, for I will always sing. When your love came down, I can sing of your love forever. 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 Over the mountains and the sea, your river runs with love for me. And I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth. And I will daily lift my hands, for I will always sing. When your love came down. I can sing of your love forever. 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 Though I feel like dancing, it's foolishness I know. When the world has seen the light, they will dance with joy, like we're dancing now. I can sing of your love forever. 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 I can sing of your love sing of your love forever. I can sing of your love forever. I can sing of your love forever. Of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see. To see you, to see you high lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing, Holy, 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 Holy. holy. In the light of your glory. 
seated everyone good morning everyone hope you guys are doing well my name is Carlos and this is my beautiful wife Anna and we just wanted to welcome you guys to the Heartland Church Amen. so who in here thinks of themselves as strong no? couple no? okay <laughs> Me too. I can kind of I kind of think of myself generally as a strong person, capable, you know, good helper to my spouse, you know, almost to a fault. Crystal's discipled me multiple times, you know, <laughs> of got to rely on God, not yourself, right? So, I was coming home from the gym about 4 weeks ago in a rush as usual and running up the stairs that lead from our garage to the main entrance of our house and about halfway up the stairs I look down and I see about three inches from my ankle a in my head huge snake uh, <laughs> so I freak out and immediately turn around and uh, run what felt like in slow motion back outside the house and uh, so I look back and the snake's just like looking at me and it just turns around and goes back towards the house in our garage. And uh, so I then proceed to immediately give my husband a call. <laughs> so I'm at the gym myself and uh, I get this video call from Anna and, and when I pick up, the first thing she says is, I can't breathe. And I'm like, you can't breathe? What do you mean? And there's like a small pause. I can't breathe. So by this time, I'm like, I'm freaking out. And I'm like, well, what's wrong, woman? <laughs> <laughs> and then she finally musters up the words to say, snake. <laughs> and as scary as snakes can be, to me, it was a sign of relief that it wasn't a heart attack like I was thinking. So yeah. I immediately, you know, rush home. And when I get home, Anna's standing outside the garage at a distance where she can kind of monitor the snake, but at a distance where she's not going to get bit, you know, like from here to there, right? So basically, I make myself up the stairs, and uh, I start kind of moving stuff around, and that's where I find the snake. So I decide to take a picture of it. So I'm like, oh, it's a black snake. They're good snakes, right? So I start moving some of the trim around that you see in the picture, and it suddenly starts to rattle its tail. And by that time, everything I thought I knew about black snakes just went out the window. Because <laughs> I didn't know they rattle their tails. So I reached out to Christy, and Christy's like, oh, yeah, they'll do that, you know, just to try to imitate a rattlesnake to intimidate the prey, you know. So I was like, oh, okay, so it's a black snake. So then I go and tell Anna, Anna, can you hand me a couple of buckets and a rake? To which I get, nope. Nope, I am not moving from here. I can grab the buckets and throw them at you, but I am not getting any closer. <laughs> By that time, I knew it was going to be a one-man show. So, so Galatians 6.3 says, If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. <laughs> so <laughs> in this moment, I learned uh, I definitely had been deceiving myself of how strong I thought I was and what I could handle. And I know, I think this can happen as we go throughout our life of, you know, during the good times, we don't really need to rely on God. We just think about ourselves and we rely on ourselves and I'm capable, I'm strong. And 
God will kind of do whatever he needs to to take you off your high horse like the snake and <laughs> remind you that we really are not very strong. We're not much. Amen. Like, we need God all the time. And so, you know, as we go throughout our weeks, let's remember this. Remember to rely on God and not ourselves. Um, and, yeah. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for always being in control. Thank you for being all-powerful. I know that sometimes when we feel like we have a little bit of control of a situation, we may feel strong, but we are really nothing without you. Father, uh, I pray that this morning that our hearts may be hearts of relying on you and trusting in you and that we can reflect this to the way we worship you. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for your mercy. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Okay, well, I have a few announcements for us right now. So if you pick up your announcement sheet that's on your um, pew or chair, we have our summer kickoff midweek next Wednesday, June 2nd at 7 p.m. So we're going to kick off the summer with a family fun night, and it is superhero themed. So if you have superhero costumes you want to put on or superhero t-shirts, I'm personally Team Marvel, not Team DC, but you know, whatever, you can do whatever superhero you want. So we want to make everybody's welcome, bring your friends, we'll be outdoors a lot, summer, just kick off the summer family fun night. And there's a good chance we're going to be having a baptism, so you want to be there Woo! for Woo! Come on! Um, so along with our summer, if you were not here Wednesday for our midweek, we kicked um, we kind of kicked off the summer schedule. So outside on the table out there is our summer schedule, so be sure to pick one up if you did not. Um, but with that, we're going to be reading separate men's and women's books and having separate men's and women's midweeks, different weeks. Sometimes we're congregational all together, parties, theme parties, all of that fun stuff. But then we're going to be also doing these men and women's books. So men will be reading a book called Warrior. Yeah. <laughs> and women will be reading a book called All the Feels. And you can purchase those for $10 out at the book table with Kara right after church today. And then she also has some other books kicking off the book ministry as well. But be sure to get a copy of All the Feels for the Women and Warrior for the Men. And then throughout the summer, we're going to be meeting and discussing them. So we're super excited for that. Again, the summer schedule is out on the table. Um, and then Katie will, of course, be putting that in the weekly announcement as well for our summer schedule. Um, uh, if you look on... Towards the bottom, there are a few singles events that will be coming up this summer. So we're super excited for that. Please mark the dates if you're single, and they're going to meet for some fun times and devotionals together. Um, and then if you see at the very bottom, just it's so it's, several people have come up to me so excited that we surpassed our special missions goal, which is amazing. So thank you for all of the generous hearts. We surpassed it with what's already been collected, plus we have pledges coming in, and God's just going to bless that. So thank you all for your generosity and how that will go and just bless so many people in the world right now and locally. And that's all. Amen. Well, at this time, um, as we do always this time of year, uh, we have some very special people to recognize. And, uh, you know, the Bible says give honor where honor is due. And we have some uh, young people in our fellowship here that have been working very hard, some for about the last 12 years, some for about the last 17 years, whatever, to uh, go to school and to graduate. And so we've got some gifts here that we want to give to our graduates. And I noticed there's a couple of them not here, so we'll, we'll uh, recognize them anyway. But if you are here and your name is called, please come forward. I've got All right. So, uh, first, graduating from high school, we've got Mia Tiawen. I know she's not here this morning. And uh, this next one, he's not here, but his brother's here. So we'll have his, on behalf of, of him, his brother will accept this award um, and give a speech in his brother's, no. He, all right, next, graduating from Harbor High School, Damian Cobian. All right, now these next ones have been in school a lot longer uh, just because they're at a different uh, level here. But graduating with a Bachelor of Science in, fi in Finance is Ted Soam. <laughs> mm. 
you want to do is take it. So this next one is kind of uh, double special because we have someone that is actually moving here or has moved to Northwest yes, Arkansas to be part of our church to do the one-year challenge. So one year and beyond um, till Jesus comes back maybe. But uh, she decided she wants to move here, be part of our church just to help build our campus ministry and build the church. And, and also she's graduating with a master's at Mizzou in agriculture and applied science. Okay. Science is no good unless you apply it, right? She knows she's a master at it, all right? And that is KP. And finally, I need a drum roll on this one, all right? This is a big deal. Okay. A little more. Okay, okay. Graduate, graduating with a Ph.D. in physics. Come on. It's like Dr. Strange. He can literally control the universe, right? Brandon Miller. I need to make one correction. It's actually Dr. Brandon Miller. Oh, no. Look, he's shaking his head. Amen. Uh, maybe, Boo, do you want to say a prayer over our graduates, and then we're going to sing Humble Yourself. All right. I'm sorry. I want Jesus to walk. <laughs> Father, thank you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for all the blessings that you've given us as a church and that you give it to each of these individuals who just graduated. Lord, their future is in your hand. Without you, it would not be possible. And we are grateful that they're able to celebrate the new stage in their lives. But help them to put you at the center of it every time. I love you for giving us means and ways to celebrate you through those guys. We love you. And your sons name my pray. Amen. in 
This is the time in our service where we prepare to take communion, and so uh, I would like to lead our thoughts as we consider how Jesus treated people uh, compared to our nature and the way that, that we tend to treat people. Our, our nature uh, tending to be uh, more critical, thinking more highly of ourselves, and regardless of who the other person is, uh, less of them for whatever reason, whatever it is that we disagree with or makes them different from us, our nature is to be biased against uh, that other person. <clears throat> I wanted to reference three examples of Jesus' interaction with people and then read a fourth. Uh, the first one being in John chapter 4, uh, the woman at the well. Now, uh, just to give you a few details here, she was a Samaritan, which means she was biracial. But that was of no consequence to Jesus. It didn't matter. He didn't look down upon her uh, or, or uh, condemn her because she was different in that way. He didn't look down upon her or condemn her or treat her differently because she, it was a woman as compared to another uh, man to kind of relate to, if you will. What he also didn't do was talk down about her when the disciples, his, the apostles, came back from being in town. He didn't talk to her uh, demeaningly, even though he knew exactly what her lifestyle uh, was. What he did do was try to direct her to repentance. And two, seeking him. He said, you know, if you knew who, who I was, you'd be, you'd be coming to me. So she wasn't seeking him out. But there's not a, any aggression towards her whatsoever. Um, it was nothing but compassion and uh, love for her, as we can see when you read that example. So I'd encourage you to read it. The next, the next example, in Luke 19, uh, Zacchaeus. So it says he was a, well, I guess it doesn't say he was a wee little man. That's uh, what we're singing about, you know. <laughs> but the scriptures do say he was a short man. And so, uh, and as a tax collector, um, he obviously, uh, in that position, he would have been seen as, as a really kind of a traitor, working for the Romans, um, collecting taxes, and out of greed, more so from people, uh, from the Israelites uh, at that time, and although it doesn't specifically say it, Jesus must stay at his, it did say he, that I must come to your house today. What it doesn't say is that Jesus specifically called him to repentance, yet we know that he did because of Zacchaeus' response. But it, it gives no mention at all, even though Jesus knew his situation, his uh, greed, because there probably was, or he wouldn't have offered the four times payback, um, whatever those things were in his life, it, Jesus did not treat him uh, in a demeaning manner um, at all. Um, the third example to share about, uh, the rich young ruler or the rich young man that came to Jesus, he was seeking Jesus just as Zacchaeus was. Uh, what do I got to do? What do I got to do to, you know, I, I want to I wanna be on the right track. What do I got to do? The, the words that, that, I remember so much, um, it says Jesus looked at him and loved him. It doesn't say Jesus looked at him and knew that in his heart money was most important. I mean, he, he knows that. He acknowledges that because that's what he calls him to repent of. But it says Jesus looked at him and loved him. When our nature, remember, I, I've asked us to consider by comparison, our nature is to always see that thing in people that we disagree with or that we, in whatever way, you know, we don't like it. And, and even if we won't say it out loud, because most of the time we're cowards and we won't, we're thinking it in our hearts and minds and uh, how wrong that is. I wanted to read the last example for you in John chapter 8, uh, verse 1, <clears throat> but uh, I'm sorry, let's skip on down to verse 3. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, 
Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. You know, the first thing that I always see in this example is that she was caught in adultery, but where's the man, you know? Uh, uh, so um, there, uh, these men, the Pharisees and teachers of the law, were already biased against this woman because somehow it was worse that the woman was involved when obviously it, it, there was a man involved. It says, uh, but Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. And when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, if any one of you is without sin, let him be first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down to write on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, go now and leave your life of sin. And, and what I wanted to remind yet again in this example is Jesus could have just let loose on these Pharisees and teachers of the law that uh, brought this woman to him, and he could have ripped into them and com been completely justified in doing so because think about the heart, what was going on in their hearts and minds as they're trying to bring this woman, as they are bringing this woman to Jesus, yet Jesus fires right back at their hearts in a way that, ha that calls them to repentance, not just identifying and chastising their sin, but in a way that makes them consider and calls them to repentance. And the woman herself, he doesn't condemn her. He knows full well what she has done. He doesn't condemn her, but he does call her to repent. In, in none of these examples does it show Jesus with a critical or condemning uh, attitude or heart towards these people, even though he's full aware of everything they have done. And that's why we have promised to make Jesus Lord, right? Because, wow, uh, we want to follow this example. And even though, as I've shared, we all know deep down that this is not our nature, to be like Jesus in the way that we deal with people and situations. But as we get ready to take communion here in just a moment, I'd like to ask you to consider how Jesus called you with the same graciousness and the same uh, forgiveness and, and compassion, not calling you with a pointed finger, knowing what you've done wrong. And, and, uh, but there should be in that such a gratitude and a realization of where we really stand before Jesus um, that should well up in our ability to and work on improving to be able to treat other people in the same way. It doesn't mean we're saying it's okay what people are doing, even our own sin, um, but we're not condemning them. We're calling them to repentance. And every one of these examples, whether it was people, uh, two of them that were going to Jesus, seeking him, and two that were not, the call was the same. The call for repentance was the same on Jesus' end uh, in any case. So let's pray as we get ready to take the bread and the cup. Father in heaven, we are so grateful that you do not treat us as our sins deserve. And we're so grateful that as you have provided the lamb for the sacrifice in Jesus, that we weren't treated uh, as our sins deserve, but that you would accept his sacrifice uh, instead of our punishment. And so, as we take the bread and the cup in remembrance of Jesus, uh, move in our hearts that we might also respond in the way that we treat and love people. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Inside of it all, 
Amen. Good morning. Uh, before I get started with the sermon, uh, I would just like to pray for the offering. So let's all bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for all the things that you give us, all the things you do for us, all the ways you take care of us. Father, we, we cannot express how grateful we truly are. But I pray that it can work within our hearts for us to decide uh, to love you all the more by giving back to you. Uh, just a, a fraction of what you give us, Father. Uh, but in a way that we give back to you everything that you've given us. Uh, by the way that we live our lives. By the way that we choose to steward uh, what it is you've granted us. So, Father, pray. I, I pray that we can just uh, be, be humble in, in the sight of you. Uh, that, that you can work on our hearts and we can be all the more close to you in the way that we give. Pray all this in your son's name. Amen. 
Man, I'm grateful to get to be closing out our series here uh, this morning. So if you haven't heard, we have been going through a, a series titled How to Have It All. Do you want to have it all? Yes, a few yeses. Yeah, we all, in a way, want to have it all. We say, how do I have it all? And maybe it all means something different for each and every one of us in this room. But all of us want it all. We want to have it all. We want to know, what does it look like for me to have it all? What would that take for me to have it all? That's what we've been focusing on for the past couple weeks. Of course, we've been looking at how to get rich. And what did we learn from that? Well, if we want to get rich, we have to be given. We have to be generous, right? It works opposite the way we would think. Well, if I want to get rich, don't I want to be stingy? Don't I want to hold on to the money that I do have? No, because God offers us richness through our generosity. And of course, last week, we talked about how to have success, how to be successful, how to find success in our lives, right? How to, how to really be successful in every area. And of course, that answer, too, was a little counterintuitive, right? Because to be successful in everything, you actually have to fix your eyes on God. We have to fix our eyes on Jesus and make sure that we're putting first the kingdom and all these things will be added to us, right? And so we're going to close out that series with how to get great friends. How to get great friends. I want awesome friends, don't you? Everybody wants to be liked. Everybody wants to have people in their lives that they can be close to. That they can be just really, really close to. They can share a special bond with, that they can feel comfortable to share anything with. Do you want a friend like that? We all want friends that, that work perfectly with us, right? That finish each other's sandwiches, yes. <laughs> that understands us perfectly, more than we even understand ourselves, right? We all want friends like that. Today, we're going to be finding the secret to building those deep, fulfilling, awesome relationships. Are you guys ready for that? Okay, we are going to start by going through some famous friends, okay? So I'm going to put up uh, typically a pair of famous friends, and I want you guys to shout out who that is, okay? You don't need to shout this one. I, I don't know all their names, but... I, I don't really watch the show, but it fits so well, you know? I had to. So uh, I'm going to click through, and I want you guys to shout out who that is, okay? We'll start with an easy one. Batman and, Batman and Robin, best friends. This is by far the best version of Batman and Robin, uh, easily. Uh, obviously the most convincing. Okay, let's keep going. Who are these? Sherlock and Watson, yes. Sherlock and Watson. In fact, one of these pictures does not have Watson in it. And if you can be the first one to share that with me, I'll be moderately impressed. Okay? Who's this? Sean and Gus. Yes, from Psych. Anybody remember this show? Yes, it is hilarious. You can see it on their faces. What a funny show. Okay, here we go. Yes, Harry Potter and the other two. Yes. <laughs> Ron and Hermione, of course. Right? Yeah, just such great friends, right? Oh, man. They, they didn't, you know, they had their differences at the start. But uh, how, about, how about these two? Yes, Lucy and Ethel. I love Lucy. Yes. Uh, these two, pretty iconic. Here we go. Yes, Timon and Pumbaa from, I believe, Disney's Coco. Um, yes, okay, let's keep it moving. Here we go. Sam and Frodo, yes. Frodo would not have made it, right? Lord of the Rings, he had the ring, and Sam's like, I can't take the ring, but I can carry you, right? Man, Sam's the best. What? We all need friends like Sam, right? What a guy. Uh, here we go, lesser known. 
Han Solo and Chewbacca. Yes, give me your best uh, Chewbacca noise. We'll work on it. Okay, how about these guys? Anybody? Yes, Leslie and Ann. Ann Perkins, as they say repeatedly. These guys are from Parks and Rec, Parks and Recreation, running the city of Pawnee, Indiana. Uh, let's keep going. Maverick and Goose. I knew Jim would know. If nobody else, I knew Jim would know. All right, and this, I believe, is our last one. Yes, Cap and Bucky, right? Besties for the resties. Uh, BFFs forever, it really seems like for them, right? So we started with our DC representation and of course ended with our Marvel pointing towards our superhero party here. So, you know, you can, you can dress up like that Batman and Robin or whatever, you know? Uh, amen. So these are some awesome examples of best friends, but the reality is is that the way that the world views best friends and best friendships is pretty skewed, pretty flawed. There are some issues, right? And this friendship is pretty cool. A lot of those have their, their moments of being awesome and things that, that look really ideal. But the reality is that friendship takes work. It takes effort. It is hard to be best friends with somebody, to find people that you can really be that close with doesn't just happen. It's something that we need to work on. And so we're going to start with this one guiding verse, and then we're going to dig into just a few scriptures to, to unveil the secret. What does it look like to get best friends, right? How do we get great friends? Well, we'll look at what that's like. So Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, it's up on here. It says, so in everything, this is Jesus speaking, in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Wise words from Jesus here. I remember not too long ago, uh, during the spring semester, we had this ICMD, uh, which of course everybody knows what that stands for, but I'll tell you anyway, uh, International Campus Ministry Devotional. Uh, so, you know, our, our campus ministries from all over, uh, all the nations would come together and have this devotional online together. Uh, you know, one of the silver linings of COVID happening was we can connect with people online anywhere, anywhere. And so we had this awesome time where they actually had the, an evening with Fred Gray. Do you guys know who that is? He's an incredible, uh, was an incredible civil rights leader. I mean, he's still alive, so he is still that. But uh, he was a, a huge part of the civil rights movement, even uh, was the attorney for Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, and he is, you know, uh, an obedient and, and loving member of, of the Church of God. And so he shared a lot. They asked him a lot of questions, but this was the scripture he kept coming back to. When people would ask him, well, what do you think about this? Or how did you go about this? Or what convinced you to speak out on this? He said, you know, just the golden rule. Do to others what you'd have them do to you. It's that simple. And what this scripture shares and what probably by the last two weeks you should have guessed today would be like is that if you want to have great friends, if you want to get great friends, you need to be a great friend. You need to be an awesome, best friend material kind of person if you are going to get great friends. The best and maybe only way is to be that best friend for other people, to be a great friend. And so what do those close friendships really need? What, do, what is really necessary for you to be able to build those, those deep, fulfilling relationships, what do you have to take on and be like to make sure you live that out? Let's turn to Proverbs chapter 27. We're going to have a couple lessons uh, from this chapter, and then we're going to move to Romans chapter 12 for a couple more. Are you guys with me? The first thing that we need for really close, really awesome friendships is conflict. I bet you weren't expecting that, right? Conflict. 
Proverbs chapter 27, starting in verse 5, says, Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Now, that, this doesn't mean you can't kiss your spouse, okay? That's fine. Don't, don't be all weird about it. Next time your spouse kisses you, you're like, are you my enemy? No, okay? <laughs> no, no, no. That's not the point here, right? There's this really deep, really fulfilling, really interesting bond that is formed with people that go through conflict together. People that experience conflict together like, like warriors out on the battlefield that are in the trenches together. There is an unspeakable, endless in depth bond that is formed by those people that experience that conflict, right? And so we need to be willing to share our conflict with one another. When things are happening in our lives and we are in conflict, we can build bonds with others by sharing them. But better yet, from your point of view, you need to be talking to your brothers and sisters and finding out when they're in conflict so that you can be there for them, so you can love them, so you can share what they need to hear. Because the fact of the matter is that some conflict that happens in our lives, this is true, and I, I regret that I'm the one that has to tell you this, some of that conflict is self-inflicted. Sometimes it is your fault, right? Sometimes you have some stake in what happened, right? There are things that happen, okay, that it's not on you, right? Sometimes things occur and you're like, well, I, I don't know what I could have done different. You know, I, this isn't on me. But there are some times where you're like, this, is, this person did this and this. And it's like, well, did you do that? Oh, uh, well, no. Okay, right? And so sometimes uh, we need to just be there for our brothers and sisters. And when they're experiencing conflict, tell them, what they really need to hear. And there are times where that is rebuke, where that is reproof, where you want to correct something in somebody else, where you tell them, look, I'm here for you, I'm there with you, in the trenches together, you really shouldn't have done that. Or, you know, it really wasn't helpful to the situation that this is how you went about it. Uh, now, I'm not saying you should come up on stage and tell them there, right? Pull them aside. <laughs> Talk to them with some tact. Amen? Get some advice about how to do this. But if you want to have great friends, you need to deal with conflict the right way. You need to be willing to get in there. And there, there are those among us who avoid conflict like it's the plague, you know? Like, give me my six feet social distance from all conflict, please. Uh, I wish there was a mask designed for conflict, right? We all want to keep our distance, or a good chunk of us. And then there are people that are, are like, give me the conflict. I'm ready, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to amp it up, dial it up to 11, right? Let's put it on blast, okay? Let's, let's deal with it all right now, okay? You know, there's, there's, there's a middle ground to be had here. We don't have to be at ends of the pendulum. What God's calling us to do is deal with conflict appropriately. Lovingly, in fact, right? The idea here is to have love for your fellow brother or sister. And to point out the things that they really need to hear out of love. Not out of anger, frustration, or annoyance, or whatever it might be, but that you point it out in an attempt to love, truly love, and truly help them, right? Even if that conflict is with you. As it says, wounds from a friend can be trusted. Who here has been wounded by somebody in the church? Who's been hurt, right? Amen, all the hands. We probably didn't need to raise hands. I should have specified, but I think all of us over the course of our discipleship will have wounds from a friend and sometimes they won't be justified right sometimes we hurt one another because we make mistakes 
But sometimes people offer an open rebuke out of love. And their intention is to help you. And so we will have wounds here. There will be hurts. There will be times that you are hurt. But instead of distancing yourself from that person because of the hurt, or instead of rushing in and giving them the old one-two so they can feel what you felt, right? Instead of either of those, deal with the conflict. Come to them out of love and share that open rebuke because you care about them. That is what it looks like to be a true great friend, is to deal with the conflict that we have. Imagine if you broke your leg and had to go to the doctor's office, and all the doctor did was gave you painkillers and said, I'm sure it'll be fine. What if the doctor's main goal was to make you feel comfortable instead of to actually help fix what's wrong with you? What if, what if that was every doctor? That's ridiculous. I don't want to go to those doctors, right? I mean, relief from pain sounds nice, but ultimately it's not going to fix the problem. And in the same way as great friends, we need to help dig at the roots of one another's issues, problems. We need to be there for each other and help. Now, don't be overbearing and just pointing out every little problem that you see with every other person. That's not what I'm saying, okay? Josh told me to point out all of your problems. No, 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 right? But we need to be there for each other and not just settle for helping each other feel comfortable. Because in the kingdom of God, we aren't meant to feel comfortable, right? We got to get uncomfortable so we can try and, and get all the more like Jesus, but we need to be, I need to be the great friend that's willing to get in there and make you a little uncomfortable, give you a wound here and there, but so that you can heal properly. Amen? Amen? So the first thing we need, conflict. Later down in the chapter, adds a little bit to this. We all know this scripture, I hope. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Now, when I was growing up, uh, my brother and I would go out to visit uh, my grandpa and the whole family on my mom's side, and they live out in the country, uh, Sedan, Kansas. Anyone ever been there? Sedan? Oh, wow. I did not expect any hands up at all, but amen. <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty out in the country. I mean, there's like a town with at least six buildings. I don't know, but like, it's, it's pretty small, and they live right outside of Sedan, so not even in that small town. And so, you know, we'd go, and while we were there, we became mighty warriors, right? We were soldiers. We were knights of the kingdom, master swordsmen, because we took these wooden planks, and we would carve them to look vaguely like swords, okay? So... Uh, we would do this, we would, you know, put it in like a vice grip, I think, that, that my grandpa had and, you know, hack it a little bit so it's a little sharp, not too sharp to like, you know, hurt each other uh, too bad. But uh, we, we would play with these swords so much. And there was actually this big uh, grind that was there to be able to sharpen tools on. And so we were like, oh, we want sharp wooden swords. Okay, so we take our wood, uh, we put it over there, and we hold it on there for what feels like hours. It's probably like seven minutes, but we, we hold it on there and look at it, and it didn't look any different. It had been rubbed a little bit, but it, it didn't look sharper in the slightest, right? And you're hearing this story, and you're like, what? I, I don't care. But the, the fact of this, this matter is that it's iron that sharpens iron. Like sharpens like. And so if I'm trying to sharpen my wooden sword, I'm not going to use something that sharpens iron, right? And it doesn't really change what you're sharpening to sharpen it with something nice. Or vice versa, if you're trying to sharpen yourself with ungodliness, what are you going to get? Not godliness, I'll tell you that much, right? At best, you're not going to get any sharper at all. At worst, you're going to become more like that. And so we as disciples need to have an affinity for one another. That word affinity means 
uh, a natural inclination towards something. To have an affinity for something or someone means you naturally incline to that person. Naturally, you're drawn to that type of person or that person or what have you. And so we need to decide what type of people we're going to go to with our problems, with our conflicts, with everything in our lives. When we need advice, who do we go to? Who do you tend to go to when you really need help? When you really need advice, when you really need input, when you need training, who do you go to? Because if you're going to something that isn't godly, that's what you're going to get. You're going to get sharpened to be more like ungodliness. Because iron sharpens iron. If you want to be sharpened to be more godly, you need to be sharpened by godly. Are you guys with me? We need to pay attention to and decide who to entrust ourselves to. Because you can't just go around entrusting yourself to everybody. That won't help. You have to entrust yourself to people in this room, people that are godly. And it's not just limited in this room, but you get what I'm saying. You need to be trained, sharpened, loved, rebuked, all that by godly people. People that are trying to live to be more like Jesus and therefore trying to help you live to be more like Jesus. And of course, this works as the flip side. You need to be a sharpener. Right? You need to be there to help sharpen your brother and sister in Christ. You need to be there for them. Tell them what they need to hear because as our iron sharpens iron, what do you get? Sparks. Right? There's going to be, going back to the last point, a little bit of conflict in sharpening. But that's all part of the process. And so if you want to be a great friend, you need to learn to have an affinity for God's people. That you just naturally go with your problems to others in the body of Christ. Amen. Amen. But also an affinity for looking when other people need help. That people feel like they can go to you. That you naturally tend towards the people of God and offer to help. You ask them about their lives. You get in there and just... Probe some questions out so you can really understand how they're doing and what they really need. And you can be that for them, but you can't if you have no clue what they're like, no clue how they're doing, if you aren't approachable. Are you guys with me? You need to be a sharpener, and we need to learn to have affinity for one another if we're going to be great friends. Let's turn to Romans chapter 12. And we're going to continue to learn more more of the stuff that we need to really be truly great friends. Right? He starts Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. Right? And that's really where it needs to come from for us. In view of God's mercy. Why do I want to be a great friend? Well, not just because I want to have and get all the great friends, but because, man, God has had such mercy on me that I can't help but love others. I can't help but be there, right? So in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You know, we're going to break this down really quickly. It does not say offer your brother's body as a living sacrifice. right? It doesn't say, well, offer uh, your sister's body. Offer your your family's body. Offer your spouse's body. Offer your kid's body. It doesn't say any of that, right? It says offer your body. And so we need to to take ownership. This will be a running theme, by the way. We need to take ownership and be that great friend that we need to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, not just call one another to it, right? It's really easy to hear this and be like, well, uh, look, look at how you need to be a better friend, Carlos, right? Jose, you need to be a better friend to me. Come on, right? 
that's not what this is about. This is about us learning to be what we need to be, right? And that is what it looks like to really worship. You know, I love our singing up here. It is awesome. Uh, you know, whoever plays bass and sings sounds excellent, mo- uh, like at least a percentage of the time. And so that's not true and proper worship, you know? Th- that's awesome, and it's helpful, and I'm not telling you that it's worthless because it definitely isn't, right? It's a way that we connect with God, and it's crucial to do, but it's not true and proper worship. Offering our bodies every day, living out everything that means, that's true and proper worship. Now, if you're offering your body while you're singing, I guess that makes it true and proper worship too. Amen? And I love verse 2 here. The pattern of the world doesn't make any sense when you really think about it. The way that the world works or tries to teach you to have or make great friends, it doesn't make sense. It's never going to add up or work the way it should. Because it, it, it doesn't fit how God originally designed us to work, to function, to live, to love, to act. And so we need to take what we've learned from the world about friendship, about what it looks like to be a truly great friend, and throw it out the window. Because we need to transform our minds, right? Renew our minds. Be transformed by that. And then we will understand what God is getting at. Amen? Amen. Let's keep going here. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Uh, Anna read something a lot like this, right? Amen. Thanks, Anna. But rather, think of yourself with sober judgment. In accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Look around the room. Look at everybody who's here. Look at everybody sitting wherever. Is anybody exactly like you? No, right? I would expect at least. I don't think we have any identical twins that are both in the room, right? But even them, they're different. They might look similar, but, but they act differently. They live differently. They, they think differently. Things are different between each and every one of us in this room. And this brings me to the third thing that we need to be a true great friend And that's realization, that we are different, that there are differences, right? We are not these cookie-cutter Christians that all look and act and think exactly the same, right? We have the same standard, amen, that we're all trying to live out what Jesus has called us to, but that doesn't look the same for maybe anyone in this room. Otherwise, what kind of a body would we be, right? A bunch of ears? What a stupid-looking body, right? I don't want a body just of a bunch of ears. That'd be weird, right? I would hear really well, I will admit. And maybe Katie thinks that's great. Uh, But a, a good body has a lot of different parts that work together in unity to accomplish the goal set forth by the head, the brains, right? And of course, for us, that's Jesus. And so we need to realize that I am different from each and every one of you. That as you deal with, as you seek to understand, as you pray with, as you live among the people of God, you cannot expect them to be like you. Because they're not. We are diverse as the kingdom of God. And I believe that that is an enormous strength. The diversity of the, the church of Jesus Christ, that's incredible. Because we can accomplish so much more. But it takes work. What does the world teach about this? Well, if you look at your average church, I'm not going to throw any in particular under the bus, you, you tend to get a lot of segregation. 
not just of race, but also of lifestyle, of age at times, of you name it. Not very diverse, your average church, right? So that's one way the world work, uh, looks at it. But another is this idea of tolerance, right? That, that you, you just kind of tolerate what everybody else does. We have to go deeper than that. We have to really seek to understand one another, right? It's not enough to just know that we're different, which is kind of where I'm at, to be honest with you guys. This is something I really need to work on, and I'm trying. Amen? <laughs> we need to do better than just knowing we're different. We need to know what's different. We need to understand one another and seek to understand one another at a level that is that is so much deeper than just, well, we're different. We don't see eye to eye. Well, figure it out, how to see eye to eye, right? You don't have to agree, but it's one thing to know that they have a different opinion, and it's a second to dive deep enough to know why. If we want really close relationships, we have to be willing to put ourselves out there, really dig in to the people that are in God's kingdom and understand what they're like. How are they different from you? There, there are millions of ways. You're never going to find them all out, but you got to try. And so if we want to truly be great friends, we need to, to realize the difference here and really go after finding out what that is so that we can even love each other all the better. Skipping down to verse 9 here, we find our last one, and it's earnest love. Verse 9 says, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Tons of practicals in here, and we're going to break them down really fast, okay? So we're going to go verse by verse, and I'm going to say maybe one thing about it. But I encourage you, on your own time, really read back over this. There's so much good stuff, and if you take away just one or two of them and really try to live them out this week, that, that's, that's incredible, right? And these are not easy. They're going to take time. They're going to take effort, and they're going to take heart. Amen? And the first ultimately sums up a good chunk of this, that love must be sincere, right? We have to be real with the way that we love one another. You can't fake it till you make it, right? You have to genuinely love, genuinely be there for others. And in your life, do you truly hate what is evil? And cling to what is good. Because by nature, we tend to do the opposite. We tend to think, oh, the good stuff is so boring. Or, oh, man, it, I feel like I'm jumping through hoops to do this. Or, man, it's just not what I want or not what I like. And then we cling on to just a few honestly evil things in our lives. That's our nature. But we got to do the opposite. We got to look at the things that are great and cling on to those and if we identify anything as evil in our lives, it's gone, right? We got to hate it. Ugh, it's disgusting. Okay, verse 10 here. Uh, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. I really love the ESV version, the second half of this verse. It says, outdo one another in showing honor. Any, any competitive people in here, right? We got to outdo each other. 
Like, you got to show everybody else up by how much you honor everyone else. Amen? So that's kind of the picture that this scripture really wants to communicate, that we got to be devoted to one another, and we got to be a little competitive with how much we love each other. <laughs> right? Like, ooh, I love I loved so-and-so way more than they love me this week. Right? Like, me and Joe, oh, I love Joe so much. And then next week, Joe just, like, wrecks me with how much he loves me. And I'm like, man, oh, okay, next week's my week. Right? And we just, we got to outdo one another. Amen? Verse 11, man, great friends really are rooted in serving God. Right? If you're ever going to be a good friend, it starts with your relationship with God. You cannot lack in your zeal. You have to keep that spiritual fervor. You got to be in your word. You got to be in prayer. You have to live that stuff out if you're ever going to be a great friend. Amen? Moving on. Verse 12. I love this word for, for hope that it uses here in the original Greek. No idea how to say it, so don't ask. But it basically translates to the expectation of good from God. We have to be happy about the fact that God has good things in store for us. No matter what's going on in our lives, we always can find joy in knowing that we have a God that loves us and is constantly looking for ways to love us all the more, and will take care of us. Amen? That's worth being joyful about. And then those other two, of course, will follow if we are rooted in being joyful in the hope and reminding ourselves of that hope. Amen? Verse 13. Guys, we got to take care of one another, right? Practice hospitality. Hospitality is everywhere in the scriptures. And we have to really live like this. I think this is an awesome strength for our church, when we're on it, we just got to make sure we're on it. Amen? We had to look for opportunities to really take care of and be hospitable. Amen? We're cruising. Let's keep going. Okay. Verse 14 here. Bless those who persecute you. How do you respond when you're mistreated? How do you respond? Do you respond with anger? Right? Do you, do you respond with frustration? Do you want to hurt them back? We can't afford to live like that. If anyone hurts you, mistreats you, persecutes you, what does the Bible say? you got to bless them. Do everything you can to express the love of God to those people. That's what it looks like to be a truly great friend. Amen? Verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. we got to meet people where they're at. Right? It, we, not everybody is supposed to conform to me. I have to learn to empathize with them. I have to learn to go out of my way and meet people with what's going on in their life, right? Somebody just did something awesome, right? Uh, Brandon gets his PhD. We all cheer, yes, right? It doesn't matter what's going on in my life. I'm happy for Brandon, and I'm going to rejoice with him, right? But vice versa is true. Somebody has something terrible happening to them. I don't care how great whatever happened to you was. You have to meet them where they're at. Amen? Okay, verse 16 here. Live in harmony with one another. This word harmony basically translates to be of the same mind. Right? This idea is not, oh, Josh, you talked to us about conflict a bunch, and now it says we're supposed to avoid conflict. That's not the point. The point is we're supposed to pursue being of the same mind. We have to seek understanding each other. We have to pursue that. And in order to do that, sometimes it requires some conflict. You guys with me? Guys, we have to learn to be of the same mind with one another. Not be so proud that people have to fit to us, but that we are willing to associate people we don't agree with because we're seeking out being of the same mind. Okay. Let's see. Verse 17 here. Have you ever heard the phrase, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind? I disagree. I think that the last guy will have an eye, at least, right? Because no one will be able to see to take out that last eye. But the principle is, is true that, guys, we can't repay evil for evil. We have to be willing to do what's right no matter the circumstance. And we have to push for that, right? We're going to make mistakes, amen. But we have to hold it hold in there, hold on tight, and make sure we're doing what's right in the eyes of everyone as much as possible. And then to close out with this section here, 
Guys, we have to take ownership. It's not up to everyone else to love you perfectly so that you are, oh, I guess I'll love everyone. No. It's up to you to step out and love when they don't deserve it. Imagine if everyone in the church lived like that. How incredible that would be. All of our needs would get met. We would all love to such an extreme depth. But if everyone in the church is waiting for somebody else to love before they're willing to love, that's not going to look good. Because one person's going to make one mistake. It's going to snowball down the hill, plow into the house. I don't know what I meant. But you get the point, right? Guys, this stuff's crucial. We really have to be willing to take ownership and not say, oh, this, is, this would be so good for Katie to hear. I hope she put notes about it, right? No, take notes for yourself, right? What do you need to grow in? What do you need to work on? And I encourage you to really think these things through. Okay, how to get great friends. Well, we need some conflict. We need to be able to have conflict and deal with it righteously. Amen? We need an affinity for one another. We need to be drawn towards one another no matter the circumstance. We need a realization that we're different and that that's good. That's not a bad thing. It makes things hard at times and means we have lots of work ahead of us, but we need to seek to understand one another. And lastly, we need earnest love for one another, a love that isn't fake, uh, that, that isn't feigned, as the, the KJV says, but a love that's real for us to live. And long story short, you need to care, right? Just care. Care about one another enough to live like these things. You got to care. If you're going to have great friends, if you're going to get great friends, you have to care first. I want to close out with one really short final scripture in John 15, verse 13. It says, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. If you want to be a great friend, it's as simple as that. Just be willing to sacrifice everything. It's simple, but it's not easy. Amen? This is what it's going to take for all of us to get great friends. We have to be a great friend, and be willing to lay down our lives for one another. To God be the glory. We are going to close out with one last song here, so I'm going to go ahead and pray, and then we'll stand up and sing. Amen? Father, we're so grateful for everything you do for us, and you have exhibited what it looks like to be that great friend. So I pray that we can look to you as the perfect example of what it looks like to lay down our lives for one another in everything. Father, I pray that we can look through uh, everything that we talked about here and just grab on to a couple things so that we can truly shape ourselves to be all the more like you. We're so grateful for everything you are, everything you do. Pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. We're going to sing one final song. I tried, I, tried, I, tried, I tried and I tried, I tried and I tried, you know I tried and I tried until I found the Lord my soul. Just couldn't be contented, just couldn't be contented, just couldn't be content, no, until I found the Lord. You know I prayed and I prayed, I prayed and I prayed, you know I prayed and I prayed until I found the Lord my soul. You know I search and I search until I found the Lord. My soul just couldn't be contented. Just couldn't be contented. Just couldn't be content. No, until I found the Lord. No, I found. Yes, I found. I found. Yes, I found. You know I found. Yes, I found. I finally found the Lord. My soul just couldn't be contented. Just couldn't be. The Lord, you know I found, yes I found, I found, yes I found, you know I found, yes I found, I finally found the Lord, my soul just
Let's have some great fellowship. We are dismissed. <laughs>